I mean, I knew I had trouble before I went to school because I struggled, but um, it was school that, like, where it's right in my face, right? It, it's because you don't fit in. I mean, I didn't fit in. I mean, I saw like all the other students being able to achieve and pick things up in ways that I couldn't, right? So no matter how much my parents told me that they loved me and I was a wonderful person, every day my experience was, like five days a week, I'm in that classroom from nine o'clock till three or 3.30, and my experience is very different than what my parents are telling me. So Barbara, I'm gonna pick up right where you left off, and thank you everybody for joining us, and um, get comfortable, because I feel like we have so much to discuss here, and there's so much hope that you bring to the table in a dialogue that is happening behind closed doors and crying parents in cars and crying students and self-worth and confidence. And you are a pioneer of solving the problem because you yourself had to solve the problem. I did. Barbara Aerosmith, even though Aerosmith is your middle name, mm -hmm. but you go by that. Well, I, I answer to almost anything, like Barbara Aerosmith, <laughs> Barbara Aerosmith Young, uh, okay. which, whichever works, yes. I prefer, um, uh, what would I call you, a genius? Can I call you that? <laughs> you can, but I, I, I don't know. I think I maybe have a genius in a very specific area related to um, problem solving in terms of learning difficulties. But I, I don't know overall that, especially given my experience growing up where I had incredible unevenness in my abilities, where some things I was um, incredibly challenged and impaired and other things that I could do with, uh, with ease. We're gonna start right at the beginning um, and go into as much as we can. And we're sitting right now in the Peterborough location of the Aerosmith School. And you were from the Peterborough area. Yes. So I love that that's a, a connect um, from we share a same hometown. When did you realize that you had a learning difficulty? I'd say probably around age three or four. So actually before I started school, I was incredibly clumsy and uncoordinated and very, very accident prone. I didn't know why. I mean, later on I learned it was part of my brain that wasn't functioning, but I would constantly be bumping into things, um, you know, tripping over things. Uh, my mother really thought I would be dead by the age of five. I was so accident prone. So I knew there was something wrong because I saw other children not being as clumsy and uncoordinated as I was. I find it interesting because your mom was a teacher. Yes. Um, did she sort of say, okay, red flags, my daughter Barbara's struggling. Did she, how did they, how did they diagnose you? And, and what year is this? I mean, what era are we talking uh, about? This, this was in 1950s. Um, so I started school, I think it was 1956. Um, so it really didn't come to the forefront until I got into school. I mean, I was aware because of my clumsiness, but um, it, I don't know that red flags were, were raised at that point. But as soon as I got into school and actually um, started school in Young's Point, um, my dad was transferred uh, to GE and the thought was it was only going to be a year that he was going to be in Peterborough, but obviously it uh, was for the rest of his career and the rest of his life. So um, in grade one, um, because they didn't have kindergarten, in Young's Point, it was very clear that, that I wasn't learning like the other children. I could watch them, you know, pick up a pencil and start to learn how to print. I was reversing everything. It was incredibly difficult. I could see them starting to be able to add simple numbers. I couldn't do that. Um, so what I did, because it was a small town, was um, I would uh, tell my teacher that uh, my mother needed my help at home because she had a, an infant and the teacher would let me go home and then I would go home and hide out in the backyard um, hoping that my mother you know, wouldn't, wouldn't find out that uh, I was skipping school. So I skipped a lot of school starting in grade one because it was just too painful. I want to talk about what you were talking about before and I know we may have been rolling but I want to I bring this up mm -hmm. again because you said something to me that just is so important and why it's important to disrupt sort of the education system, but not just disrupt the education system, offer choice mm. for students who struggle. And what you said was, no matter how much my mom told me, no matter how much my dad told me that I was good or I was smart or mm -hmm. I was capable, 
the rest of the world, which is a huge component mm -hmm. of our children's lives, and I think we underestimate that, mm -hmm. was telling them they weren't. That's correct. And because, I mean, my parents clearly loved me and thought I was, you know, a wonderful young girl. Um, but my experience five days a week for most of the day was in school. And there my experience was that I wasn't wonderful, that I couldn't do what all the other students were doing. Um, and it was, it was embarrassing. Um, it was really painful. So when we moved to Peterborough and I continued in grade one, uh, my strategy was instead of playing hooky, I would spend long periods of time in the washroom. So I'd put up my hand and tell the teacher I had to go to the washroom and then I would just stay in the washroom. And I think actually my teacher didn't mind that because she didn't really understand why I was struggling, you know, why I couldn't write, why I was struggling with reading, uh, lots of reversals. If I saw was, I would read it as saw. Um, if I saw, you know, 12 and 15 and had to add them, I would add the one and the two and the four and the one. And, and so my answer didn't make any sense because the numbers didn't mean anything to me. So the whole world was uh, confusing and I got the strap in grade one. Um, I don't know quite what the rationale was, whether that would, you know, make me learn more effectively. I just really think, you know, at this point I have compassion for my teachers because they just didn't really understand um, why I couldn't learn and maybe felt that it was that I wasn't trying, but I was trying really, really hard. You don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. The teacher feels like they're not doing their job because you're not delivering on what they told you should be able to deliver on because they're doing their job and it creates this big conundrum what i hear from so many people and why i get so passionate mm. about the education system is because exactly what you're saying and, and i understand that we need a certain amount of grit and resilience and struggles and healthy stress mm. to build the character and build who we are and let's be honest elephant in the room what you've been able to accomplish has a lot to do with those struggles that you endured but it does, yes. the mental health mm -hmm. toll, mm -hmm. you tried to take your own life when you were in grade eight. That's correct. I mean, it was towards the end of grade eight and I just couldn't imagine what high school would be like. I mean, I had struggled so much through elementary school and I just saw no future for myself. I mean, it was incredible, incredible despair. I mean, the blessing was because of my learning disability, I didn't really understand how one went about ending their life. So I did what I thought one did, went to bed with the assumption that I wouldn't wake up the next morning. And then when I woke up, rather than being excited that I was still here, it was another opportunity to attack myself that I couldn't even get that right. This book um, is one of many that you have and uh, I love it because we can read it to our children and when children can find their own um, idols, so to mm. speak, of others who've, str who've struggled, you speak about hitting your head on the dryer mm -hmm. and that breaks my heart, Barbara. Mm. It, it does and I, I really, I mean what makes me so passionate about this work is I really feel if I can make a difference or my work can make a difference to children that are having the same struggles as I do, so they don't have to feel that kind of despair. If we can get this kind of work into the school system in the you know elementary grades um, where these students learn that actually learning can be enjoyable, it can be fun, it doesn't have to be that incredible frustration where you feel that you're hitting a wall or in my case, you know, hitting my head on the dryer or pulling out my hair. I did both of those things. When I came in today, I've been here before, and uh, I, I, I can tell you it changes lives. And I don't know if you watch X-Men. No. But I couldn't help but think I was in Professor Xavier's school. Mm -hmm. And there's all these exceptional people. They're, they're mutants in, mm -hmm. in, the, in the comic book. But they are all brought together and celebrated and, n and know what they're capable of because it's nurtured and and I just feel like you have built an, an incredible facility here mm -hmm. and uh, all around the world. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you about the premise because I love what Aerosmith is and that is that we're not going to work around the learning difficulty. We're actually going to change the brain mm -hmm. so that you can do it and you did that. And that's that's correct. I mean, I, I had, at the point when I started to create this work, I was 26 years old and I had tried 
every compensation and every workaround that was possible and I probably had even invented some of my own. So I had really learned to use my strengths, my um, photographic visual memory, my verbatim auditory memory to get as far as I had gotten, but at an incredible cost. It meant really uh, to get through university, working 20 hours a day, sleeping four hours a night, seven days a week, which you know had uh, negative effects on my health, impacted my immune system. And I kept thinking there has to be another way, there has to be a better way. And I was really blessed. My father was a scientist and an, an inventor, and he had instilled this um, belief in me as a child, he, he said that if there's a problem and there's currently no solution in the world, he said it's your responsibility to go out and find a solution. And then he said another very wise um, piece of information. He said if the rest of the world tells you you can't do it, he said don't be limited by conventional wisdom. He said this is how science goes forward, go out and find a solution. And I had no idea how I was going to do this, but that was always there in the back of my head. and. Um, at 26, came across research coming out of Russia, a brilliant neuropsychologist, Alexander Luria, who was looking at the brain and understanding that you know there are different functions and different regions of the brain that come together to carry out tasks. And then he wrote a book with a Russian soldier, uh, Leo Vizetsky, who'd been um, in World War II and injured in a very specific part of his brain. And when I read this man's journal, he was describing the kinds of problems he had were which were exactly the problems that I'd had since birth. You know, he couldn't uh, tell time before his wound. He could tell time. I was now 26. I still couldn't read an analog clock. He couldn't understand relational concepts like greater than, less than, bigger than, smaller than. I couldn't understand those concepts. My notebooks were full of diagrams, so I'd use my right hemisphere to support what I didn't understand in language. Um, he would like listen to conversations and he described meaning just disappearing into a fog in my journal you know halfway around the world and uh, you know a few decades later i was describing living in a fog so now i understood the nature of my problem it was part of my brain that wasn't working the way it was designed and to solve a problem you first have to understand what the nature of the problem is and then i came across another line of research at the same time uh, coming out of berkeley rosenschweig's work looking at neuroplasticity and all of my schooling I've been told your brain is fixed basically the brain you're born with is the brain that you die with so if you have a problem you're it's almost like a life sentence you, you just have to learn to accept it and to work around it this research was suggesting that with uh, stimulation and experience you can actually change the brain that was with rats but I believed if rats had neuroplasticity humans must have neuroplasticity it just kind of made sense so I was desperate at that point I just again saw no future for myself sort of like I was in grade 8 and I thought what do I have to lose um, other than time, I still couldn't tell time. So I thought maybe I can look at Luria's description of what that part of the brain does and find an activity that would stimulate it and work it. So that was the beginning of, of this work. So I set myself out, up with the task of um, working on that part of my brain and I used clocks because it wasn't that I wanted to learn how to tell time but I wanted to force my brain to see a relationship and if you think about relationship the hour hand and the minute hand work together and move in tandem to interpret the the, uh, the time and so that's that's the origin of, of that exercise. What was your motivation to learn because I think sometimes it's easier mm -hmm. to not do something that's hard. So if it's hard for you, if you have a cognitive blocker mm -hmm. to understand time or whatever it is, what motivated you to even want to learn to do it? Well, I think it's because this area was so central. It's, it's one of the most important cognitive functions. I mean, telling time seems like that's something you can avoid, but it wasn't just telling time. It was seeing um, relationships everywhere in my life. So relationships with other human beings. I didn't understand why people did things. I didn't understand why things happened in the world. So my world was incredibly confusing and it was pretty frightening because I would see somebody behave in a certain way towards me and I didn't understand it. So I felt incredibly isolated. Um, and also if I listened to a conversation, I could memorize what the person was saying, but I couldn't interpret 
the meaning of what they were saying. So it was almost like I was listening to a foreign language and I couldn't translate or translating was incredibly slow and difficult. why didn't you just shut off? Like, do you know what, I, like what drove you to want to fix it? It was just a miserably unhappy existence. Was, you know, I had this image where I felt like, um, you know, my face was pressed up against a plate glass window and there was a banquet on the other side of that window. And I could see all these people enjoying themselves and, and having a good time. And I wanted to be part of that, but I couldn't. Like, it, it was just, it was an incredible barrier. So I felt like I actually wasn't part of, of human discourse or human relationships. So I, I was incredibly unhappy, sad, anxious. I mean, I was afraid if somebody said something to me that I wouldn't understand what it was to then understand, you know, how I could interact and respond. Um, so I, I just, I, I couldn't imagine how I could continue on in that state. So I felt like I had to do something. It, it was so central that I just couldn't avoid it. It wasn't like, um, you know, that, that I, couldn't read and then maybe I could get somebody else to read for me right. or um, get, you know, a reader that would read or books on tape. This was central to my understanding myself, my understanding of my world, mm. um, well beyond just being able to handle academics. The, the silver lining of misery. Yes, yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Forces you. What I love about what you've created, um, we're going to talk about the, the learning disabilities and, and that in, in one moment, but what you say is the brain is like a muscle, mm -hmm. but it's actually better than a mm -hmm. muscle. Um, can you explain that in terms of what happens when you learn how to, to mm -hmm. overcome these obstacles that are, are That's hard right. for you? Yeah, so uh, the premise is you find a task or an activity that is going to work that part of the brain without the support of other areas. So it's, it's kind of like a laser focus going in, um, finding the level that you need to start at that isn't too easy, which means then there's no stimulation or too difficult, and then the brain can't engage. So find a, a task or an activity, start at a level that's kind of like exercise. Mm -hmm. You have to strain to some extent. You improve, you you know, you know, come up to that level, then you keep stepping up the, the, um, the level of, of difficulty until that cognitive function or that area is functioning the way it's designed to. Um, usually at an average level, in some cases we can bring areas up to av above average. And then the, the idea is um, that once that area is functioning in the way it's designed to function, it gets its own stimulation afterwards by working within a neural network. So if we're reading, multiple areas come together to read. Now if we've improved, say, the visual memory for symbol patterns, that area now is working in concert with those other areas and it gets stimulated um, so you don't have to keep doing the exercise. Whereas before, if that you was just weak, build on it. That's right. If it was weak, it was a drag. It was pulling that the rest of those areas that were functioning well down when performing that task, such as reading. So now this area has come up, and it's engaged in the neural network involved in reading. And by being used, now it's it's getting its own stimulation. It's just fascinating, right? Because it's there. It's so connected like mm -hmm. you can't separate one from the other Absolutely. you need this with this we are one mm -hmm. entire system it's mm -hmm. you you can't solve this without dealing with this as well I, I'm fascinated with how many adults are on the other side and mm -hmm. I know parents all of a sudden it's like a click for them because mm -hmm. they're like that's what I struggled with and now they mm -hmm. see their child but now we have this language and these tools to actually support and help mm -hmm. them um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the the number of problems that you have that you address here and then I'm going to talk about who doesn't fit into this mm -hmm. and why. Um, right now you have, do you have 19? 19. 19 mm -hmm. learning and I really hate this word, we're going we're gonna to have another conversation about learning disabilities, we're going to call it learning difficulties. Um, motor symbol sequencing, symbol relations, memory for information or instructions, predictive speech, Broca's speech pronunciation, auditory speech discrimination, symbolic thinking, symbol recognition, lexical memory, kinesthetic perception, kinesthetic speech, nonverbal thinking, narrow visual span, objective object recognition, spatial reasoning, mechanical reasoning, abstract reasoning, primary motor, quantification sense. What I wanted to ask you about this is, 
do the children that come or take part in the Aerosmith programming, whether at the school or within their own school, do they have to be clinically diagnosed by a doctor under this or do you do it here for them? Okay, so the, the students, most of the students that come have experienced some kind of difficulty in learning in school. They don't necessarily have to be formally diagnosed. Okay. Often it's a parent that um, will recognize the challenge or the, the mm -hmm. difficulty that their child is having and they haven't gotten a formal diagnosis of what we call a learning disability here in North America. Um, and then once a student comes to the program, we put them through the assessment, looking at the strengths and weaknesses yeah. in those okay. 19 cognitive functions. And then we come out with a unique learning profile. And this profile will say these areas the individual is functioning very well. These are average or above average. This area might be a mild level of difficulty. This one might be moderate. This one might be severe. So we create that unique cognitive profile that gives a lot of insight. I mean, what we find is parents, once they go through that profile, say, now I understand why my child behaves in this way or why they struggle in this way, why they're gifted in this way because often parents will um, be confused because they'll see in certain areas the child can excel and do very well and then other areas they can't and this gives the explanation to that unevenness because it's looking isn't at different that, cognitive functions. Isn't that true for everyone? It is true for everything, everyone. I mean we have lots of adults that come to this program that would never be considered uh, learning disabled or having a learning difficulty, but they've known all their life that there's an area that they just feel has caused them difficulty. I remember a retired professor from the University of Toronto that came in at 74 and she'd never been able to recognize faces and it always bothered her. It hadn't oh. impacted her in her career, but she decided at 74, I'm going to work on that function. We have a program for that. She did and now she can recognize people's faces and she's a lot happier. Isn't that incredible? Like I, you mm -hmm. know, we always think about ourselves, right? And I'm thinking mm -hmm. about me and numbers and accounting and like the, the and um, I know you couldn't read maps. Maps to me are like, mm -hmm. ah, uh, mm -hmm. but I'm amazing with directions. You know, mm -hmm. it's just funny mm -hmm. that we can find ourselves in all of this. Uh, I love this because for so many parents too, and I don't know if this is across the board in other, I, I'm, we're in Ontario and Canada, but often you're recommended to get a psych ed mm -hmm. assessment, which um, can take such a long time and mm -hmm. also if you do it privately can be it can be really costly so that isn't always necessary i guess is it, what i'm getting at it isn't necessary and even if somebody comes to us and has had a psych ed assessment i mean it's interesting we will look at it however we have to do our own assessment because most psych ed assessments a lot of the tests that are used are what i call composite so um the measures are calling on multiple cognitive functions to perform that task. We have to go under that and look at the individual cognitive functions to see the strengths and weaknesses. So we have to do our own assessment because that tells us um, these are the areas we need to work on, these are the areas we don't need to work on. I never want to, um, you know, waste a child's time working on areas that they don't need to work on. How are you today? cognitively and your learning and everything. Well, so I'm getting a little older. <laughs> Fun <laughs> I, fact, we like all do. A little, a little, a little of that cognitive decline that they talk about. I like to think maybe it's just I'm a little tired. Um, <laughs> but the good news is, because I know the cognitive areas and I have programs for them, that I can actually kind of tune up my brain as I'm getting older and maybe some of those you know, synapses aren't firing or neurons aren't firing in the way that, that I'd ideally like. But you know, I, I have none of the difficulties that I had growing up. I mean, I can make connections. I can That's understand incredible. why things happen. Uh, I worked on that part of my brain that um, located sensation on the left side of my body, so I'm no longer clumsy. Is I'm it no conscious for you? Like, do you have to think about it, or did you no, just? No, it's just automatic now. Wow. I can navigate. I can read maps. Um, I travel all around the world now speaking and talking about this work and meeting with researchers. and. I never get lost, whereas before I always had to add in at least an hour, sometimes two hours of what I call lost time to allow myself to get lost multiple times before I found my destination. Now I can find the destination and I actually prefer maps to GPS now because I like to see, you know, the kind of the layout and the structure and the spatial relations, which before um, it was almost like I lived in like a flat earth, right? I just didn't see how streets connected. I couldn't interpret maps and now I can.
I just, my brain is just overwhelmed with the potential applications mm -hmm. of your exercises. I'm thinking of Alzheimer's and aging and people who are, like it's just, mm -hmm. we just don't pay enough attention to our brain. Mm -hmm. We really don't. Yeah, well, my dream, my real vision and dream is that every child starting grade one, um, for 30 minutes a day, five days a week, they do one cognitive exercise. So it's just a normal part of curriculum. And I've got a whole design. I know what I would do in grade one because I would pick the motor planning, which is, is what a child is, is um, learning in grade one. They're learning the motor plans for writing and for eye tracking and reading. Grade two, I do the visual memory because that's really important for learning spelling and word recognition. Grade three, I do the numeracy piece. Grade four, I'd probably bring in the reasoning. Grade five, I'd do the, the symbolic thinking. And imagine, like, every child would be getting good cognitive stimulation because what do we learn with? We learn with our brains. We go to school to learn. So a tiny amount of their day would be taken up stimulating the brain. And then each school could have also a cognitive classroom for the students that have more areas that might need a little bit um, you know, more intervention. So there'd be this, this beautiful kind of stream that they all children are are working on stimulating cognitive function and then there'd be no stigma. I mean there's still tremendous stigma to having a learning difficulty um, where often children get bullied, they get made fun of. Everybody would be doing the cognitive program so every child would benefit. We've done that in a school in Australia with tremendous results. Um, we've now just done that, I think, in three schools in North America, and we're just analyzing the results. Um, again, just every child in grade one doing a cognitive exercise. I would love to see that implemented. Mm -hmm. I would just, I, I would just love to see that. And that's that's the thing. I mean, we're in a physical location, but your dream is to have this programming accessible to every student. Absolutely, in every school around the world, and and that's a big part of you know when I travel and and uh, speak. We're now in uh, schools in Spain. Um, we're in Thailand. We're in Malaysia, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the United States. I may have missed some <laughs> some countries, but that's I mean that's the goal. What I find so profound about um, we've come a long way, and I think mm -hmm. it's super important to celebrate the successes and the achievements we've made as a society and recognizing and embracing. And we've come a long way, but we always have, we're, you know, we're always moving forward and we always can improve. The brain can change. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's so powerful. It's, it, to me, it's incredibly powerful and it's incredibly optimistic. Like things that we thought, were immutable, unchangeable, we now know can be changed. I mean, learning, learning difficulties, but also, you know, there's great research looking at, um, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, all sorts of conditions that before we thought people had to live with, depression, anxiety. You know, if, if we can kind of understand neuroplasticity, understand the principles of it, and how we can harness that, it has incredible implications. There's research now looking at chronic pain and neuroplasticity. I mean, it, to me, it's very, very hopeful. And what is life without hope? Mm -hmm. You know, it, and your dad gave you that, right? Your mom too. Yes. But they, they gave you that hope that mm -hmm. you, you had a job to do. I did, and that there was a possibility that I didn't have to stay stuck in all the pain and suffering that I lived in. And you certainly achieved it. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know how much of this you want shared, and if you don't, we can cut it out, but I did ask you off camera if you had children, mm -hmm. and uh, you answered no, that you were unable to, to have children because, possibly because of the stress that had mm -hmm. built up in your life because of all of the trauma that you've had endured. Mm -hmm. And I said, but you ended up having so many children. Mm -hmm. It's a favorite part of my job is when I get to travel around the world and go to schools where my program is implemented, my favorite part is actually going in and talking to the students and hearing their stories and hearing um, the, the changes that have happened in their life and what they like about the work, you know, what their favorite exercise is. Um, that I absolutely, absolutely love. And, and also hearing, you know, their struggles that they've overcome, you know, meeting little children like 10, 11 that have, um, you know, anorexia or 
you know, suicidal thoughts because of the struggles of their learning difficulty and no child should feel that much pain. So that's what keeps me going. I have beside my computer at home, because sometimes I get discouraged, um, I have a little picture of a, a young... She is human. Yes, I am, of, of a young girl. She was the first student. She, her parents were both medical doctors in Toronto and they came to me and the little girl was five. And I hadn't ever worked with anybody quite that young, but they were really insistent. So I took some of the exercises, I made them simpler, and she had a lot of, lot of areas of, of difficulty. And so I keep her picture um, beside my computer to remind myself of all the children that can be impacted. She's now a medical doctor. Um, in Toronto, right? And and I think what her future would have been like, because she, she had significant learning difficulties, obviously bright, um, and significant learning difficulties. So it's just when I get discouraged, I look at her picture, and I just think of all the other children out there that you know can have a different future if we get this work out. And I'm very clear too that, you know, my work isn't the only work that can benefit children. It's a piece of the puzzle. And I think you know, there are a lot of people now working on this puzzle to try to make a difference. It takes a lives. village. Yes. It truly takes a village. Yeah. And I, the other thing I want, and I, I know you know this, and you, and you say this point often, children are not, humans are natural learners. Mm -hmm. So when somebody doesn't want to do their homework, I think sometimes we often think that they're a lazy child, and the, and we often put these labels on mm -hmm. these kids, um, and and you need to look beyond the behavior, because everybody wants to learn. It's it's innate. It it's is how I mean, we it's are wired. Exactly, mastery motivation. Like we want to master things. Yeah. And exactly, if somebody is avoiding, if a child is avoiding a certain aspect of learning, there is a difficulty there. I remember one student thinking her middle name was can do better, right? Because that's all she heard, you know, Devorah can that's do better, uh, you know, so she, <sighs> she came to me and thought that was her middle name um, because that's all she heard, right? Or, or not trying hard enough, like all those labels that we put on children. And these individuals are working probably 50 times harder than the child that's excelling and doesn't have these difficulties. And, and that's how I felt, like that I was working so hard just to tread water and keep my head above water. If we don't create mentally healthy children, mm -hmm. and that means confidence, mm -hmm. and believing in their self-worth, and knowing their true capabilities, we will not have mentally healthy adults. Exactly, and there was a brilliant study that was actually done here in Canada, very proud of us Canadians. Uh, it was done by the Learning Disabilities Association of Canada. Um, and anybody's interested, you can Google um, Learning Disabilities Association of Canada. It's called the Putting a Canadian Face on Learning Disability, so Packfold. And they looked at census data and a lot, a lot of data and discovered that you know individuals with learning difficulties had three times the incidence of depression and anxiety disorders, like actually diagnosed disorders, and it got worse as they, they got older. Um, they looked at the financial cost of having a learning disability from birth to death and estimated something on the order of 450,000 per individual, some born by society and government, some born by the family. Um, they looked at you know, employment and that these individuals are either more marginally employed or unemployed. Interestingly, they looked at physical health, and this is what made me think that my immune system disease was a result of the learning difficulty, and they found individuals with uh, learning disabilities, as we call them here, or learning difficulties, had a much higher incidence of, of physical ailments, physical conditions, illness um, as well. So the, the cost, and I mean, we're, you know, we're <laughs> like a first world nation, and like the, the cost to society, the cost to individuals of having a learning difficulty that doesn't really have to be born, especially if we can understand neuroplasticity and we can harness um, neuroplasticity to change the brain, to take what was a weakness and actually shift that into a strength. None of these costs have to be born. Invest in our foundation. Mm -hmm. That's what yeah. will build a strong home. Yes. And our children are our foundation. 
Barbara Aerosmith Young, I think you are incredible. I think you are changing people's lives mm -hmm. and uh, one leaf at a time. And um, the next thing we got to overcome now is getting rid of that word, learning disabilities. Right. <laughs> learning difficulty. <laughs> I much prefer that. Mm -hmm. And um, you are a hope and inspiration to so many. Continue on your work. And I can't wait to see those cognitive exercises be implemented. And I want them for my own age. Mm -hmm. Can you make them for 39-year-olds? Oh, I made them for 81-year-olds. Perfect. So, yes, absolutely. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.